Good morning. Welcome to Lincoln Square Presbyterian Church. We gather here in God's presence to give and respond and give thanks to the one who has called us and created us in Christ. And so uh, as we begin our time, I direct you to take the order of worship from some announcements. Inside the, the front cover is uh, the list of sorry, children's classes and let's see if I can fix this. Um, children's classes. <laughs> Maybe not. Um, and uh, the things that are happening today. So you'll see that there is a junior high class along with the preschool and the children's worship class. Um, also, if you then go all the way to the back, there's some announcements that I wanna make sure that we highlight uh, before beginning our service. Um, one is that next Sunday after church, uh, we're inviting everyone to go to the, the Rockwell uh, Church office and community space for an extended fellowship time. We'll have bagels and cream cheese and coffee and so that will be uh, just shortly after the service. You can head over there. The address is there if you haven't been, but it's 4635 uh, North Rockwell. Uh, also coming up is our Ash Wednesday service on March 2nd. That's the beginning of the season of Lent, and that's at 7 o'clock here uh, in the Nazarene Church building. And we're actually going to do a service together with the uh, Northside Church of the Nazarene. So that will be on March 2nd um, at 7 o'clock. Um, also, Brian has an announcement uh, to make. Um. Good morning. Um, so for our Lent class this year, we are going to be in the uh, Exodus story in Scripture. And we're going to use uh, for our guide through that is this book called Leaving Egypt, Finding God in the Wilderness Place. Um, I have copies of this. Uh, if you're interested in coming, uh, I have copies today. You can come and, and uh, come ask me about that. I can give you one uh, I, so you can get started in reading. So, yeah, we'll explore just the, those themes of Exodus, um, really how they mirror our, our own journey out of places of brokenness, out of places where, where, where we may experience some binding and things like that, into freedom, into life, into healing. And so... It's a good journey. It's a good book that is both sort of hitting those theological realities, both um, as they and, and yet getting closer to our own personal stories. And so if you're interested in this, it's going to be five weeks. Like I said, it begins March, uh, Wednesday, March 9th. We're going to meet at the community space at 7 p.m. Uh, I have books today. If you would like, if you know that you'd like to come, uh, I can give you one. So, all right. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Well, this time, the children who are going to the preschool class or children's worship or to the junior high class, they can make their way to the, the back of the sanctuary. Melinda's there in the, the back corner, and also Pastor Eric is there for the junior high class. Uh, they soon can join him uh, to go down to the classroom. Well, as we are called by God, let's take a moment of quiet to prepare ourselves to come before God in worship. Good morning. Our call to worship today is from Psalm 37. If you'd stand, we'll sing together. in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. The steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong for the Lord upholds his hand. The Lord loves justice and has promised he will never forsake us. The Lord loves justice and has promised he will never forsake us. 
little that the righteous has than the abundance of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the blameless, and their heritage shall remain forever. The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their stronghold in the time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them because they take refuge in him. The Lord loves justice and has promised he will never forsake us. The Lord loves justice and has promised he will never forsake us. Let's pray together. Almighty God, gracious and merciful Father, you're slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Lord, as we just sang together, we pray, uh, we pray that we would rest our weary souls in thee. And you, O Lord, whose love will not let us go that pursues even when we run, even when your love invites us into those uncomfortable places, to see our own need, to receive your kindness that would invite us, like Jonah, to turn directions, even when that direction feels costly and hard. Father, for many of us, it may be hard to come this morning and not be distracted by the questions, the uncertainties, the longings that hover around us. So God, remind us again that our home, that our peace, that our sense of flourishing is not tied up in all the remedies of this world. But Lord, give us faith to believe that you are the calmer of the seas, that the water that you give, it quenches the deep longings of our soul. May your perfect love, your love that is lavish and relentless, may it meet us as we come this morning. May it saturate our stress, our anxiety, our fear. May it meet us in all the ways we seize control and seek only our own interest. May it find us when we feel alone and checked out. As we worship God, as we hear your word, Father, remind us that we are your children. Lead us into safe pastures, away from the dangers of sin and death, away from the accusers, the deceiver's voice, to find the rest and the freedom we need in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. 
Father, all we, uh, we, we pray all of this in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, we turn now to our time of confession, a time to acknowledge with God our sin and our need of him. And we'll do this together as a church and then have a time of quiet personal confession. O Lord, have mercy on us. Give us courage to see our sins and confess them to you. We pray for you to restore us that we may live a life of peace and joy and that you may be glorified by our love for one another. Merciful God, in your presence we confess our sin. Although Christ is among us, we cling to our anger and resentment and our judgment of one another instead of enjoying the freedom of your reconciling love. Set us free to trust in our Savior and to love one another. Amen. Please take a moment of quiet, personal confession. Gracious God, we are thankful that you came to us in our weakness, in our greatest need of rescue. While we're still sinners, you descended into the depths of our sin and death to be in our place and to raise us to new life. We give thanks in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, let's stand together to hear the words of, of assurance that come to us from Psalm 145. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry, saves them. You may be seated.
The New Testament lesson today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 35 through 38 and 42 through 50. But someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? You fool, that which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body just as he wished, and to each of the seeds a body of its own. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthly. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthly, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. The gospel lesson is from Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 38. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. And whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either. Give to everyone who asks of you. And whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. And just as you want men to treat you, treat them the same way. And if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same thing. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. And do not pass judgment, and you will not be judged. And do not condemn, and you shall not be condemned. Pardon, and you will be pardoned. Given, it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. They will pour into your lap. For whatever measure you deal out to others, it will be dealt to you in return. This is the word of the Lord. It's good to be able to join you for worship and look at God's word together. Together, Thank you, Laura, for reading from the scriptures. We're going to continue looking at the Old Testament book of Jonah. We have two more Sundays left, uh, two Sundays to look at this final chapter of chapter 4. But before we uh, read our passage, um, I want to mention that when we started this uh, a few weeks back, uh, the question that I asked us, or the questions are, you know, what do we know about Jonah? What, if anything, comes to mind? Maybe, maybe nothing, but if something did come to mind, I imagine it's likely about the great fish, the great fish that swallows Jonah and eventually spits him out. And as we enter this fourth and final chapter, I, I want us to start with another question, and the question is, how does this book end? How does this book end? It didn't end at chapter two with the great fish and Jonah's release. 
It did not end at chapter 3 with Jonah preaching to the Ninevites and their response of repentance. Pastor Tim Cather writes, of all the books of the Bible, Jonah has the most unexpected and overlooked final chapter. Out of all the books of the Bible, <laughs> how does it end? Well, we'll see that it ends with Jonah outraged. It ends with Jonah burning with anger, exceedingly displeased. And we're going to look at that experience that Jonah has today and next week to think about what that might mean for us. So let's read our passage. This is the last verse of chapter 3, then the first four verses of chapter 4. You can follow in your order of worship or in your Bible or just listen as I read. When God saw what the people of Nineveh did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? This is God's word given for our good. Well, just as a reminder, or just as we kind of briefly heard here, against all expectations in this story, a city known for its cruel violence and lack of mercy, the city of Nineveh, repents. And given our experience of living in this world, we know that this is astonishing, shocking. They believed God, and they turned from their violence, from their evil ways, and God sees this, and he does not do the judgment, does not bring the judgment that he said he would bring. And we're led to ask, how does Jonah respond to God's grace and mercy to the repentant Nineveh? How does Jonah respond? Well, we just read, it displeased him exceedingly. He burns with anger. You can picture him in his heart or even outward saying that this is wrong. This is wrong. He prays, oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was in my country? This is why I ran from you. This is why I went to Tarshish instead. For I knew that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life, for it's better for me to die than live. One author writes that a true prophet, a true prophet reminds the self-satisfied of their flaws, that they are not good or sufficient in themselves, that they are not God. And interestingly, Jonah, even with his running and even with his rage, he does this prophetic work for us. I was trying to find a word to think about, you know, how to capture Jonah in this moment. And the word that I found is anti-example. I don't really know if that's a word. Anti-example, one who reveals or guides through his failures. And what I want us to do in our sermon this morning is to see two aspects of Jonah's response and how in these failures that he has, that he might point to our own struggles. We're going to look at how he is a, a man of contradiction and a man of prejudice and how, in God's grace, his failures might allow us to see our own contradictions and our own prejudice. So first, we're invited to see and feel the contradiction of Jonah. Look, we, we see this right away, right? A prophet of God is displeased when a city of sinners experiences tremendous moral reform and responds positively to God. We are to feel the irony of this. And we hear the contradiction in the why that Jonah refused God's call. Lord, is this not what I said would happen? 
God, I knew it. This is why I ran away. Again, what, what is it that Jonah says that he knows? He knew God's character, and he knew God's posture towards sinners who ask for help. Right away, Jonah quotes from Exodus 34, a passage that is repeated throughout Israel's history, and it's, it's like a creed answering this question of who is our God? Who is our God? And that Exodus passage is, reads, our God is kind and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Who is our God? Our God is gracious and merciful. Scripture uses these adjectives specifically for the Lord. In expanding on them, the Exodus passage then says that this gracious and merciful God, he is the Lord who forgives wickedness. He is the God who forgives those who rebel and sin. Jonah cites these verses, but says that this character is exactly the problem. A few weeks ago in our book discussion, we looked at the novel Bedrock Faith that Ozzy led us through. And as I was reading this passage, I thought of a section of that book where the main character is this respected woman in the neighborhood, but she begins to be criticized. She's criticized because she is showing kindness to a neighbor who is very unpopular. A neighbor who, for good reason, is not liked by the other neighbors. And this respected woman is critiqued. And the novel says they are really upset with her. And one of the characters adds, there are times you can take Christian kindness too far. There are times you can take Christian kindness too far. And I think that's helpful for us to think about how Jonah is feeling in this moment. God's grace and mercy, his steadfast love, has gone too far. And Jonah running away was his attempt to stop it, attempt to maybe guide God in being a little wiser, a little less naive. And maybe we can think even for ourselves, what about us when we hear scripture like welcome others as Christ has welcomed you or forgive as you have been forgiven, or even as we heard the passage that Laura read from the Gospel of Luke, to love your enemies, to give generously and don't ask for it back. On one level we can say it's beautiful, but another we can ask, is it maybe a little too much? Foolish. You see, Jonah, in this moment, here's one who knows Scripture. He likes to talk about God. He even identifies with God who projects himself as righteous, but he is not interested in displaying or going along with God's way at this moment. I knew this would happen. We can't just be handing out grace and mercy to anyone, especially people like the Ninevites. How differently Jonah would have ordered events if he was in charge. And as a result, he is offended. He's offended by God. And again, Jonah, his posture is a chance for us to wonder together, is it, is it possible to eliminate everything from the faith that would offend our sensibilities? If we pick and choose what we want to believe, or how will we ever have a God that could contradict or change us? Rather, we'll have a God essentially of our own making. And maybe even to ask the question, why would we assume that there, if there is a God, the maker of heaven and earth, why would we assume that this God would not have views or ways that upset us, that seem a little too far? In Jonah's case, when the gracious and merciful God, who was slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, when he shows up to grant mercy to awful sinners, to the outsider, to the enemy, to those Jonah can never identify with, 
Jonah is filled with rage. It's too much. And Jonah speaks of God, but finds himself far from God's ways. And his contradiction might make us a chance to consider our own in our life. And that's the first thing we can see in our passage. The second is that we're invited to see and feel the prejudice of Jonah. The prejudice. I recently saw a post online of a ruled, a piece of a ruled notebook paper with pencil, you know, uh, lettering on it. And it was a post of a young daughter taking notes of her dad's reactions during the Super Bowl. <laughs> I'll just read one part of the section. It's in line after line. Coming out of halftime, football starts again. Dad screams. Dad covers his face with his hands. <laughs> Dad screams again. Dad laughs. Dad jumps. Dad's fighting with the dog. Dad does his evil laugh. Dad is the happiest person alive. The last two lines, the game goes to overtime. And the final line, Dad cries. I don't know if those tears are tears of joy or of sadness, it doesn't say. Maybe you can relate. For some of us, sports has a way of bringing out a range of emotions in a relatively short period of time. I mention that because we see something similar in this shockingly short book, you know, just a few chapters. Jonah displays a very realistic but wide range of emotions. He flees. He hides. He cries out in despair. He rejoices in thankfulness. He is determined to obey. He burns with anger. He is exceedingly displeased. And here, along with anger, we hear Jonah pray, Therefore now, O Lord, take my life from me. Take my life from me. These are serious words. Hard words, and we need to be careful with them. For us to acknowledge together that life is painful for many different reasons. And at time, that pain can be overwhelming. In Jonah's case, he is so upset with the recent events, he doesn't want to continue. I can't take it anymore. How does God respond? He doesn't say to stop. He doesn't say, you know, a word of admonishment. Rather, I think graciously he asks a question. Is it right for you to be so angry? Do you do well to be so angry? Questions are very important in Scripture, especially when they are asked by God. And the role that questions normally play is an opportunity for us to pause, to consider, to reflect, and to look even inward. And in this case, to ask, why am I so angry, so upset? It's important that we know that anger in itself is not wrong, but as God's leading here, it is worth asking why it is present or if the target and the intensity of the anger is appropriate, if it makes sense. In Jonah's case, it seems his anger and his despair tell us that something very important to him, something very important to him has been threatened. Something he trusted is now in question. What is it? But it seems that it is his distinction from the evil Ninevites. I am not like them. I am not like them. He has something that they do not have. He is something that they are not. I think we could say that Jonah would prefer a world in which the Ninevites were not part of it. He hates them because of their actions and what they've done. Wouldn't things be better without them? And not only do I have to deal with them now, but God's going to forgive them. But God's going to forgive them. All of us are marked by contradictions, and all of us are marked by prejudice. For Jonah, it is this kind of foundational sense 
that's now in question. I am not like them. And we are all, though, tempted in different ways, tempted to boast in or place our ultimate identity, our sense of self, in our background, in our appearance, our accomplishments. Or we're all tempted to reduce the other person in some way that they are less than us because they are different from us. And when our source of superiority or source of self is threatened, we can feel like Jonah, displeased, angry, and I don't want to go on. Why are you so angry? Jonah's prayer here is not like the prayer he said in chapter 2 when he was in the belly of the great fish. In that moment in chapter 2, he is confronted with the reality that he too needs God's mercy. That he has to admit that he needs God to do something other than give him what he deserves. And at that point, with clear vision, he gives thanks for God's steadfast love. Thank you, God, for your steadfast love. But now, but now when it's directed to someone that he does not like, does not want to be around, or who is less than him, he finds it despicable. Why should Nineveh, people like that, receive such mercy? It appears that Jonah has forgotten God's mercy to him, or maybe he has decided the situation is different, that his mercy was deserved, or that his mercy was less severe, or that he wasn't as bad. And again, Jonah and his range of emotions, his forgetting and remembering, he is so much like you and me. One moment crying out, thankful for God's steadfast love, the next finding it deeply disturbing that someone else might receive it. Is it right for you to be so angry? God in his grace is inviting Jonah again to see, to see again clearly and to remember his mercy. That Jonah like us, that we might find our identity not in what we can do or what we've done or how we're different from others, but that we can find our rest in the God who made us, who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, the God who in Christ forgives us of our wickedness. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. And we thank you that you use people like Jonah, even in their failings, to point to what is true. And so, Lord, we ask for your spirit to open our eyes, that we may see in ourselves things that are broken and misguided. And help us to repent and turn to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you stand and join us in singing?
Heavenly Father, forgive her of our every sin. Help us look to Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, as our advocate and redeemer, not only for ourselves, but for your whole world. We praise you for your never-ending faithfulness as we join with your people on earth and all the company of heaven in the unending hymn. Having heard God's word, we're now invited to the table that God sets for his people. As we participate in communion, we're going to participate through uh, these prepackaged elements. If you're planning on taking communion, um, if you need one, uh, just raise your hand and, and Will can bring one to you. Great. Well, if you're planning on taking communion this morning, if you're a follower of Christ, then I invite you to go ahead and prepare those. You can open up the, the package to re- prepare to take those elements. As we gather at the table, this question of who is our God is an important question that runs through Scripture, and it's an important question for us, for there are many thoughts all around us. Who is our God? We heard, testified in the Scripture that our God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Who is our God? Well, we see that description on display here at the table that Christ sets with his own body, the table that's set for sinners that they might find a seat as children of God through the broken body and shed blood of Christ. For his mercy and grace, his steadfast love means that he bears our sin, our wickedness, and our iniquity in himself. This is the good news. And it's the good news that leads us to see our neighbors in new ways, where we are all those who need God's mercy We're all those who have a place at the table only because of God's mercy to us in Christ. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this table. I pray, Lord, that you would set apart this bread and cup for a holy use. 
and that your spirit would minister to us. As we come in repentance, as we come even with guilt and shame or questions, Lord, meet us where we are. Lift our heads. Let us rest again in the work you've done that we may be called children of God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, after giving thanks, Jesus took the bread and broke it, saying, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Christ's body was broken to make us whole. Let us eat in faith. And Christ's blood was shed to cover all of our sins. Let us drink in faith. As we respond to this table of grace, I invite you to stand with me that we can pray and sing as God's people. Lord Jesus Christ, you have promised to make all things new. By your spirit, remind us that you have already paid our debt before God. And help us to look forward to the future with hope as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come. Let us declare our faith in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised to life on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Afterwards, he appeared to his followers and to all the apostles. This we have received and this we believe. Amen. Christ has been generous to us in the work of Christ and we're invited to respond in generosity by the giving of to the work of the church. And so I invite you to do that. You can give uh, in the offering plates in the back after the service or through the church's website. Let us now respond to God's generosity by singing together the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Receive now God's blessing. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole body, spirit, and soul be found blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who is faithful will do it. Amen. May go in peace.